Oi, oi, it's your boy, old sweaty bollocks himself, Jack Slack, coming at you on Tuesday the 12th of July, because I got stuck in the airport yesterday for fucking hours. Um, so we're a little bit late, but there will still be two podcasts this week, one for the boys, one for the plebs, and um, we're going to start by belatedly examining that UFC fight night from the weekend, UFC fight night bleh, at the Apex. Um, So Apex level event, (laughs) Apex level, great for everything else. If you're an Apex level predator, you're the bomb. If you're an Apex level UFC event, you're six guys from James Krause's gym versus six guys from Safe Sayud's gym. Not the famous ones. But the main event was Rafael dos Anjos versus Rafael Fizev, um, or Fiziev, the two Rafaels of the lightweight division. Both of them party dudes. And it's been in the works for a while. I think it was February this one was supposed to take place originally, and then they moved it back and moved it back. I don't think there were any injuries or anything. They just decided to move it back twice. But um, it was a really good fight. And Rafael dos Anjos, we talked about this last time, and I've talked about it every time he's come up since, and every time we talked about the lightweight division, I've just, I think it came up heavily when we were talking about um, Ismagalov versus Kutate Ladze. Did I get that right first time? Fucking banging. Um, Just realised I didn't explain the sweaty bollocks introduction and I shook my bottle of water at the uh, screen just then. It's the hottest day of the ever in the UK today. So I'm sitting in the dark because the blind's down, um, the fan's off, the windows are closed so that I can actually podcast. And um, I'm bollock naked doing this podcast. So have a nice think about that. My sweaty balls on my chair. I had to peel them off when I stand up. Um, So yes, last time we were talking about the lightweight division, the state of the lightweight division, I was talking about Rafael Rafael dos Anjos, RDA, being overranked. He's been ranked forever, and he was ranked forever off that win over Paul Felder, who was basically retired at that point, but was was training for a marathon, and they offered him the fight at short notice, so he came back and fought Rafael dos Anjos. Dos Anjos beat him quite handily, and um, because the UFC ranking committee is a clown car of only 14 men and most of them are like DJs or randomers from radio stations you've never heard of. That was enough to shoot me up the rankings. That and beefing with Islam Makachev because people, they wanted, they were desperate to do that Makachev RDA fight because RDA's problems typically have been getting held down or not being a strong enough wrestler to get people down. Um, But he did have a great performance against Tanato Moicano, um, which... I only vaguely remember, I think it happened while I was away for a while, and um, I don't think I ever properly caught up on it. I think I might have just skimmed it. Meanwhile, Fazeev's been on a, a great little run since, I think he came down from welterweight, and um, he's yeah, he's looked fantastic, except for against Bobby Green. Bobby Green gave him a hard time. Um, but he's, he most recently stomped uh, Brad Riddell, and yeah, he was coming into this. This was his biggest name opponent, opponent yet. Yeah, great chance to shoot up the rankings. Um, you know, replace some of the old blood in the top 10 with some of the new blood, uh, because that top 10 is looking very different to how it was three or four years ago. And, of course, Rafael dos Anjos was the world champion at at one point. And um, did he defend it twice or just the once? He defended it against Don Cerrone. Don Cerrone somehow got a title shot. But when he smashed, well, his run up to the title and when he smashed Anthony Pettis for the belt, that was one of the most impressive little runs I've ever seen for someone who came into the UFC being one thing and then changed... Well, you know, it's the story of lightweight MMA. Guys reinventing themselves. I love it. So the story of this fight was pretty much Rafael dos Anjos uh, entering on takedowns and not being able to complete them. Uh, Fiziev's takedown defense is something like 90-something percent. He's looked incredible stopping takedowns. He's very dangerous from the clinch, uh, being from... Is it Tiger Muay Thai? But him and Piotr Yan are the, are the two guys really doing work with damaging strikes from the clinch. And the thing with the clinch striking is... There are strikes that are really powerful that are better coming out of or entering a clinch. And I think that's the secret to good clinch striking. I think a lot of people think that you're just going to hold someone and try and knee them. And you just don't see that because it's very hard to... While it's cool to bang off 100 knees on the bag, you know, curved knees, um, when you see that in Muay Thai even, that's just... It's, it's looking busy most for the most part. It's, it's very hard to start positioning yourself for good knees when you're already clinched up with someone. Typically, it's on the brakes, and if you can off-balance someone first. And Fiziev and uh, Piotr Yan are amazing at that. And Matt Brown, obviously, is the one that we always talk about. Cheetah Vera. Um, 
Leon Edwards is very, very good at elbowing people on the break, but it's really sort of just that. Actually, no, he's very good at setting himself up to hammer in knees almost undefended. So he's, he's actually a rare example of good knees from within the clinch. But most of Fazeev's work in this one uh, from the clinch was defensive. I suppose the, the prospect of him breaking with the elbow, which he did a few times in this fight, is more of a threat than it is, um, you know, even if he doesn't land it, it's always a threat that if you give him too much space or you get lazy coming out of a clinch, because, you know, if, you, if you're if you in a body lock along the fence or you're in a, an over-under along the fence and you think, I'm not getting this, it, it suddenly becomes like, oh, I better stick to him because if I try and exit, he's going to elbow me on the way out. Or if you try and elbow them, you know, RDA was not super active with strikes while he was in these clinches. And uh, Fiziev was looking like an iron table, just hard to get off his feet. One thing I sort of noticed in this fight was uh, RDA was uh, southpaw, uh, Fiziev was switching, but mainly orthodox. And RDA would throw the left overhand or whatever, the left straight, and he'd duck in on the lead leg and um, dig the underhook on the other side and sort of run the single double hybrid towards the fence. And I noticed that he tended to, in the early rounds, sort of stand pushing into his underhook and um, Fiziev was able to turn him off the fence and, and get away. Uh, whereas in the third, fourth, fifth rounds, when it started to have more success, he was leaving that underhook behind and leaning all his weight off to his right side in that single underhook pin along the fence um, so that Fiziev couldn't really push him off. He just smooshed, him, smooshed one side into the fence and then just kept him from going out the back door with the underhook. But I think a lot of the success that he had in the later rounds, uh, which wasn't even that great success, was due to just the um, the build-up of attempting them over and over again. And it's, it's hard to fight off takedowns for five rounds. You know, this is... Is this Fazeev's f- uh, first five rounder? I think it is. And obviously, Dos Anjos has done it before. Not a huge finisher, but been in main events and been in title fights. And great conditioning. You know, if, if you watch those uh, Pettis... I mean, one of the reasons he's always had the um, performance-enhancing drug accusations is because one he he looks lean as hell when he comes in um and two he's very very strong very very durable uh, and and lasts through the full five minutes sorry full five rounds working at a high pace but he got stuck in sort of not being able to work not being able to put the pace on Fiziev because he was caught in these clinches where he couldn't really do much to off balance Fiziev or, or get anything going on the feet i was quite surprised by rda's boxing i thought his um his jab looked really sharp when Fiziev went either stance, he'd, he'd uh, smack him in the eye with the jab. Um, I thought, yeah, for the most part, uh, Dos Anjos' boxing looked better. Um, Fiziev, there was actually... Uh, Fiziev, this week, there was beef between him and Con- Conor McGregor over the highlight of him leaning back at the waist and kicks missing, and Conor McGregor saying, oh, I'd just turn that into an axe kick. <laughs> but um, the lean back at the waist is, you know, it's very common in Muay Thai. You'll see people like uh, Sang Chai, well, I mean, you'll see fucking everyone do it. Uh, it's the way to get back out away from a, a, a high kick. But typically when you're dealing with a boxing-centric um, or a, you know, a traditional kickboxing, well, what is traditional kickboxing? But, you know, more, uh, st- less Muay Thai-based style of striking. Uh, leaning back from strikes, uh, you know, you typically want... I mean, this is the thing with Ali. People look at the photos of him leaning backwards and, and lose their minds. But the Ali back lean relied on him getting his rear foot, his right foot, far back behind him because he wanted to be able to bounce back off that foot and keep his balance. You know, look at the photos of um, him leaning back against Joe Frazier or whatever. His his head is back, but his uh, rear foot is also way behind him. He's in a very long stance. And that's how you do pull counters like Floyd Mayweather and countless others. You jab, you lean back onto your back leg. You, you basically stretch your stance out. You lean back onto your back leg. Often your back leg goes back after you've stepped in with a jab, you uh, go back onto the back leg, you lean away, often you turn sort of side on so you're not leaning straight back, and then you come in with the right hand over the top again. But this back lean that Fazeev does and that you'll see in Muay Thai a lot is, is mainly more for show. Um, I mean, you know, obviously it, it defends a high kick, but it, it also just looks amazing. And obviously in, in Muay Thai, because of the arcane form of judging, where it's like knees mean the most, kicks mean the second most, or maybe kicks mean the most and knees mean the second most, then it's elbows, then punches. and it Just any time, like, uh, a foreigner has a close fight with a tie, some dude will always be in the comments explaining the, the criteria to you. Um, and it is sort of arcane and, and just nonsensical. But it, it's, it's mainly vibes-based. And um, 
But you'll you'll see that he has his feet both underneath him, and he's leaning straight back at the waist, like uh, doing limbo. And he's you know his knees go forward, but there's not a foot behind him catching him. So it's very impressive visually when you see it. Uh, but RDA was able to use that quite well. He kept stepping in to throw, like well, he'd look up and really stand up straight as if he was about to throw a high kick upwards, and he'd bring it down to the body, and it worked really nicely. He'd catch uh, Fizzy lean, leaning back and just sort of slap a body kick in. I don't know if it did a ton of damage, but he was catching him when he was out of position. Fizzy was landing his own kicks to the head, uh, to the legs and body. Uh, they looked good, and he was switching stances to do so. Uh, did some work out of southpaw. The knockdown came off a right knee, shifting through into a left swing and then a right hook afterwards. But he shifted through stance to southpaw. Uh, and that was very cool. Uh, kind of reminded me of um, Takeru's moments of success against tension in the third round, where it doesn't matter if you're trying to knee the guy in the head or just picking your leg up, faking a teep and doing the float step in. Um, you still step forward into another stance and then you can punch with your hands as you, as you land. Uh, so yeah, that was really nice. I think the main takeaway for me was the the grappling. He looked so strong there um, against a really savvy old vet. I liked RDA's boxing. I liked uh, Fazeev's kicking. I liked I liked RDA's kicking. You know, his mechanics clearly weren't as sharp. He wasn't as fast and finely tuned. But uh, he had him he had him reading some things wrong. You know, he's throwing the high kick and going or, or showing the high kick and throwing it mid level, which I really liked. There was a few on this card of of guys. Chitching, switching levels mid-kick or, or looking one way and kicking another. And um, that was really cool. So what's next for them both? I mean, RDA will keep having fun fights forever. Um, you know, they, they do... There's always this debate about whether he's a legend or not, but, like, the number of great guys he's fought. And, of course, he won a world title and defended it. So, yeah, I, I'm very much inclined to say he's a legend. And still very much capable of giving great fights to young up-and-comers and beating them, as uh, he did against Tanata Moikano. Next for Fiziev, man, you got to slot... Ah, well, he does give them a nice out with Benil Dariush, who was sort of floating around title contention. You slap them together, um, you do your Islam versus uh, Oliveira, you ignore Volkanovsky and put him in against Josh Emmett, and that'll all shake out perfectly if none of them get injured. And most importantly, we keep Mike Chandler out of title con- contention until he answers me on Twitter. <laughs> I was asking about um, UFC bootlickers and... Uh, you know, like, how does it help you defending fighter pay? Because, uh, you know, I'm always saying I want fighters to be paid more because it would raise the standard of the sport. And uh, someone tagged Mike Chandler with something nasty they said about him. And he was like, oh, virtue signaling, blah, blah, blah. Have a nice day, you all. And I said, uh, hey, Mike, big fan. Uh, what are your thoughts on the revenue split? Got lots of likes. Resounding silence from Mike Chandler. And I was very sincerely asking because I'm always interested because it's not money going to the single fighter. It's, it's money going to the gym, everyone involved in taking a percentage from the fighter, which is where they lose a lot of their money, gets a bigger number as well. And it's always interesting for me because fighters who make it to the top, the people like the Israel Adesanyas, the Volkanovskis and so on, they are, uh, they rely heavily on their sparring partners and training partners and teammates who are often not nearly as successful as them. You know, if you want an extreme example, think of the Conor McGregor, Artem Lobov, Paddy Houlihan, all those guys, but mainly Artem Lobov. And on the one hand, you could say like, oh, well, Conor bought him this watch or whatever, and, and so on. But as Conor McGregor or, or the Conor McGregor character in that situation, do you not see them being undervalued by this league that makes billions of dollars a year and has 18% of the profit going, to the, or the, sorry, 18% of the revenue going to the fighters, where every other major league in America has 50% of the revenue going to the fighters? Sorry, <laughs> the uh, athletes. So I was really interested, but... Mike Chandler, not interested in talking about it. Just looking for those sound bites, making those inspirational speeches and inspirational tweets. But this was all because of like Dana White giving two hundred fifty thousand dollars to that loser from the dick stretching company, Jelk. Anyway, enough Twitter drama and, and what's been going on in that side of it, May. Uh, what else was good from this card? I was excited for Kyo Baradio versus uh, Armin Petrosian. He got it done. He looked convincing. It just wasn't very exciting and he wasn't really near a finish at any point uh didn't it was another one of those performances where control on the ground was um taken for uh, in place of effective damage on the ground or effective work on the ground i feel like a lot of this is the thing because control is a 
weird th- uh, thought anyway. Control is... Is control holding a guy and not letting him move at all? Or is control being able to let the guy work and reading him and moving with him or moving to cut him off um, or taking advantage of his movements? You know, someone like um, Gordon Ryan or someone like that, they're not always smothering their opponent. They're encouraging them to to go different ways. Um, Where I think a lot of these guys, even very high-level guys, the um, Aljamain Sterlings, and we talked about it especially with that fight, but guys getting on the back, and knowing that that's the best position, or it should be the best position, and not really being able to give it up. And I gave the example of Rafael, De San- uh, sorry, Rafael Lovato, the third Rafael in MMA, um, using a body triangle from there to come up on top of the Dagestani handcuff, land a couple of strikes on Musasi, move back to the back, threaten some stuff, come up on top. Uh, Shinya Aoki, also pretty good at this. Or at least go to something else. You know, If you're not going to keep punching through rear naked chokes or... Well, this is the thing. People will keep going for rear naked chokes, but your arms get gassed out, so you end up in this sort of stalemate. Um, if you're not going to try and get on top and strike, I mean, I hate holding the body triangle and striking while you're both sitting there looking up at the ring lights because you're not going to do any damage, but at least threaten the arm bar or, or try something, you know? Um, and that's what's been quite interesting about Andre Muniz, um, his rise. He's just obsessed with the arm bar from the back, so he doesn't really go for the rear naked choke. It doesn't really go for top positions that much. Um so you got sort of, this, yeah, it's, it's weird because he's giving up control, but he really wants a specific, he wants to funnel someone through a very specific set of reactions to get his armbar. Uh, and I think it, this is the thing. You just need to be able to come up on top and hit more if you're going to be, I want to say successful in MMA, but at least liked in MMA because you can win fights by holding the back. It just makes people hate you. And Borali has been a much more exciting fighter in the past. He's got some really nice striking. He held his own comfortably with a uh, Petrosian on the feet. Um, and he's got some interesting jiu-jitsu, but he got to the back, and that was the end of it. He was like, I cannot afford to lose the back. I'm staying here. At least in two of the rounds. In the second round, he went for a guillotine and fell off, which then encouraged him in the third round to not take any risks when he got the back. So what else was good? Um, Syed Nurmagomedov versus uh, Douglas Silva de Andrade is one that lots of people have been talking about, talking about rightly so. It was a case of that um, Zabit striking, or Instagram striking, TikTok striking, I suppose is the more modern example, uh, you know, uh, term for it. But when I say Instagram striking, I mean, <laughs> I'm going to do tons of spins. We're going to chop them into a highlight reel and put them on Instagram, and I will become a famous fighter. Um, yeah, just spinning for no effect. So many of these spins didn't land, didn't do anything. Um, he threw a lot of high kicks that didn't land, but at least they were interspersed with body kicks. There was stuff that he was building off. Uh, the spinning offense was almost completely detached from everything else. And he also kept spinning at stupid times. You know, we always say you don't need a really nice back kick. You don't need a really swish back kick. You don't need Joe Rogan's back kick. You can, if you can walk the opponent along the fence and spin as they're walking to your lead side, you're going to hit him, which is far more important than having a technically correct back kick. Um, And if you can do it spinning on spot as the counter or jumping as a counter, you're going to land it which, again, is much more important than having a technically perfect back kick. And that's true with all spinning techniques. And Magomedov kept backing towards the fence and then spinning as his back was to the fence, which is the time you don't spin. That's a really bad time to spin. There are some examples of cool spins working off there. Um, who was it? Oh, Emmanuel Newton, the big homie. Uh, he did a beautiful one against Joey Beltran. He got famous for spinning back fists, and he'd step across himself do them this was back in like 2013 and i think there's only been three or four uh spinning back fist knockouts in the ufc so he might have had more spinning back fist knockouts in the space of two years than there had ever been in the ufc because he scored i think two or three um he did king mo with one that was one i remember but joey joey beltran he just spent the fight circling the fence crossing his legs and waiting for beltran to step in and when beltran stepped in to swing on him because he was a you know, Beltran's a, a grindy brawler type guy. Uh, Newton spun, hit him in the jaw with the back fist and knocked him out. But this one, he just kept spinning every time Andrade came close along the fence and, and spinning for back kicks and things too and just ending up giving up his back and getting picked up in the air and dumped or um, falling over himself and landing on the bottom. He ended up on the bottom, I think, three times off spins. And one of them was he span for a back fist as he was circling into... Uh, you know, a circling on the fence into a spinning technique. 
which is where the one time that you know a guy's going to spin is if he's got you against the fence and you circle past his lead leg. He's probably going to spin. And Nurmagomedov span to do that. You know, span as he was entering the the uh, what should be your trigger point for attempting your spinning techniques. Uh, and he basically what happened was he got hit over the back of the head with a spinning back fist, which is awful. That's the worst thing I can imagine happening to you in a fight. Uh, ended up falling down, obviously, because he'd just been brained by a spinning back fist across the back of the head. An illegal striking zone, but totally legal in this context. Um, totally legal in this context. And, yeah, spent the next uh, 30 seconds or whatever on the bottom. Did like his uh, regular kicking game. Thought that was really good. His hand looked decent. He really bloodied... Um, Deandraj up, even though Deandraj always gets bloodied up. Deandraj loves, and I said this last time he fought, but he he last time he fought, he went completely blinkered tunnel vision. He loves the left hook to the body to right straight, which is a banging combination and works all the time, but it was the only thing he was doing last time he fought, but it worked a couple of times here. It was really nice. He landed a nice high kick of his own, backing uh, Nemagomedov up to the fence. I would say Nemagomedov spent far too much time along the fence in this for my uh comfort uh i'm very because this is the thing he's in a division full of awesome strikers much better strikers than deandraj deandraj is just sort of a grindy all-rounder uh, and game whereas when you get into the top end of phantomweight it's people who actually know what they're doing and i don't know if just the body kicks and question mark kick and spins are gonna be enough you know i said his hands looked all right but i i don't th- i wasn't blown away by them uh, and his ring craft left a lot to be desired. Granted, he looked good in the clinch along the fence with his back to the fence. Um, there was a nice one where he threatened to come off the fence and then as he, he was backing onto the fence again, he's, he almost put his own back on the fence just to hit an Uchimata and then escape. Like anyone who does cool um, overhook work along the fence with their back to it, but uh, that's sort of making opportunities to get away, but... You don't want to see people repeatedly putting themselves there because you are still at the disadvantage. It's still worse for you than having your back to the middle of the cage. Especially if you're a kicker and you like a lot of space to work. Because Deandraj was about half his height and <laughs> probably giving up five inches of reach and he's still hitting plenty because he was always backing himself onto the fence. Will say, I did see something new in this fight, which was cool. Elbows to the ankle of a, of a supine opponent. Very cool. Something Sakuraba could have come up with. But probably wouldn't have been allowed in pride because no elbow. Oh, they did allow elbows to the body, so they would have allowed elbows to the legs. Uh, and you did see the odd elbows to the thigh from closed guard from people who didn't want to stand up. Um, I called it based and baran pilled because any any elbow to the limbs is is moi baran, a limb destruction. But yeah, no, I could see you really ruining someone's day with elbows to the ankle. The top of the ankle is is very exposed. No one has fat tops of ankles or muscular tops of ankles. You're going to hit a tendon probably. Um, and top of the foot is another one that you can really hammer hard. And I always, when people do foot stomps along the cage, I know it sucks getting your feet stomped on, but your feet, the, the bottoms of your feet are, are quite padded themselves. So you're smashing their foot, but with like a pillow, whereas an elbow is just a shard of bone. And if you start smashing uh, feet with that, that's going to suck. So anything else stand out to me on this card? I really liked um, the very first fight, Kak Ramanov. I cack-handedly said that. Kak Ramanov versus uh, Ronnie Lawrence. I thought this was a really fun fight because Kak Ramanov was dominating in terms of getting the takedowns and scoring the positions. Ronnie Lawrence was doing all the right things on the bottom. And it was one of those matches that just cemented to you why disadvantageous positions are disadvantageous positions. If you are a shit-hot guard player and you're submitting people, um, you are outskilling them in that area. You really have to because every... uh, you know, a lot of the advantages are on their side. The gravity, if you're in MMA, the striking, them being able to just sort of lean on you and stall you out while you have to actually make stuff work. And if, they, if they're if they taking a rest, you're normally feeling their weight. Uh, Ronnie Lawrence got taken down very early and hit a beautiful giggler to get the underhook, not a full giggler sweep. But if you, gi- if, you, if you giggle someone, if you do the giggler, which is that one from half guard where you catch one arm and you tilt your, your um, legs so that the opponent... Tips over to one side, the uh, Mansour Barnoui sweep, sometimes called the John Wayne sweep, the twist sweep, the knee lever. Um, shout out to Magid Haj, who hit a load of these in the ADCC trials. Just did an uh, instructional with BJJ Fanatic, which I've been binging 
uh, of him breaking down because he went to four of the ADCC trials because he's got dual citizenship. So he did two American ones, two uh, South American ones, and he I think he came runner up in all four of them, which is really sad because there are you know he lost to the absolute best guys in the world, so Mika Galvao, um, Cade Ruotolo, or Ty Ruotolo, um, but he beat five people, six people at each, and he's just done a, a breakdown of, of each one, going through them move by move and saying what he did and why he did it, and they're absolutely brilliant. He hit about five of these gigglers and swept people in the course of those bouts. Constant use of the giggler. Um, but Ronnie Lawrence used it to get a, an underhook and started coming up and then got wizard back down. The takedowns from Kak, Kak Ramanov were gorgeous. That Just the basic principle that Habib has been embodying forever and this, it was sort of the AT, sorry, the AKA uh, American Kickboxing Academy game plan for a while. I don't know which one of them came up with it, whether it was the AKA coaches uh, and they taught it to the Dagestanis, or whether it was uh, a Abdul Manap Namagomedov trick that they taught or game plan uh, that they taught to the AKA lads. But they've been doing it forever, you know, from DC to Luke Rockhold to Habib. Get your body lock, your single underhook body lock along the fence step your knee to the middle and either hip throw them or just whip them off the fence. A lot of the time, the guys whip them off the fence and the, the opponent will uh, let go of their overhook, which stops you going to their back, swing it over your head to put it down and catch themselves so they don't fall to the mat and end up on the bottom. And then you run around to their back. Um, but you can also step in the middle and do a big hip throw, which is, you know, you saw it against um, Tiago Moises by Islam Makachev. Habib did it to a couple of people too, but... These ones were just gorgeous. He's just ragdolling him through the air, turning him upside down. And his striking looked okay, but it was mainly um, great scrambles on the ground, really back and forth stuff. In the wrestling, it was overwhelmingly Kak Ramanov. Looked really good. Don't know if this is de his debut, but I'd seen Ronnie Lawrence before and I thought he was good. So really impressed with Kak Ramanov. Um, Kennedy and Chuk and Chukwu, or is it Chukwu? We've laughed about this guy tons because he's just, he's been crap in the past. <laughs> he's just been sort of covering up, doing the Homer Simpson and then tiring people out on his forearms. Um, but he fought Carl Roberson, who almost knocked out Glover Teixeira with illegal elbows. Um, but yeah, passable guy. And uh, Kennedy and Chukwu decided to wrestle and just bodied him. It was all over him from round one to round three. Finally finished him with elbows from the mount in round three. Uh, but threatened ch rear naked chokes constantly through round two. Really impressive. I don't know if he's turned a corner, if Robertson sucks. I don't know what's going on. But perhaps we're on our way to having an African king at light heavyweight as well. Chase Sherman versus Jared Vandera was three rounds of two guys just banging. Um, but yeah, I was impressed how much they took, but still wouldn't tune in to see either, ideally. Jamie Malarkey versus Michael Johnson was terrific fun. I thought Malarkey's jab looked great. I thought his step-up low kick looked great. Um... I think they were saying he's trained with Volkanovski recently or something like that, but they fought back in the day and Volkanovski um, knocked him out on the Australian scene. But yeah, his step-up uh, lead kick looked great. I thought that could be a Volkanovski touch. Uh, his jab looked good. The only thing that was letting him down was his right straight. When he threw it, he often didn't move his head afterwards. And really, with a guy like Johnson, who's going to slide back to his left, he's a southpaw, he slides back to his left and he throws his left hand over the top. Or he parries your right hand and throws the same hand in a big looping swing. And he caught him with loads of those, turned his chin around. Um, weird thing I noticed was that Michael Johnson loves to slide back slightly to his left, which is how you, um, as a southpaw, can draw someone forward. If you watch uh, Wilson Hayes versus Henry Cejudo, Henry Cejudo's just started doing the karate hottie stance, and he constantly spirals around back and to the left, back and to the left. I need to get the sound bite of that. It means that if the opponent comes for you and you move off to the left backwards and and you get the angle. You can throw the left hand over the top of theirs. You can throw a left high kick at them whilst they're out of position. Or if they do a better job and keep turning to face you, you can uh, time them planting their foot to step down the outside of it and get the, the slightly dominant angle and shoot the left straight and start moving past them. So it's a nice way to... Uh, it's a good way to start leading people around in an open guard matchup because it works the same for the orthodox fighter against the southpaw if you back off to your right if you just keep going back into the right not just straight back because obviously you get punished for that back into the right and you keep sort of gently spiraling out but one of the things that i did notice was that um when malarkey stepped his lead foot outside of johnson's and, and started working down shooting down the left side um throwing his right straight and left hook and whatever uh, he'd catch him with the left hook, but often Johnson would go back and try and shoot a left straight to the body or to the head. A lot of left straights to the body, which I really like about Johnson. But he'd shoot a left straight to the body while trying to pivot 
and he'd throw himself way off balance when doing it. His shoulders would come well forward of his hips, um, and he'd just sort of be really badly out of position. I thought Jamie Malarkey could have hammered him with a good kick or something when he had him out of position like that. Um, but hard to you know pick up on that when you're mid-fight and both of you have been chinned because <laughs> these guys took lumps out of each other. Um, yeah, really just a, a reminder of Michael Johnson being very good, not always winning his fights and, and being a little bit frustrating to watch, and Jamie Malarkey being game as hell. And it honestly looked better technically at the, in this fight than he has possibly ever. I thought he looked really sharp against a guy who, you know, this was Michael Johnson looking fast. I know I always say that uh, speed is a binary thing in fighting. You're either the faster or slower fighter. But from the outside, having seen him in slower performances and in sloppier performances, I thought he looked quite good. And Jamie Malarkey still managed to edge the decision. So good for him. And he did it on the feet too. In fact, it was the, the good takedown attempt was from Johnson in this one. Hope they keep Johnson around forever. He's a, um, a real benefit to whichever division he, he is choosing to fight in at that time. I suspect a lot of people want me to rag on Ricky Tercius because that was a fucking dreadful fight. He came out and it was like he just read the Tao Jeet Kune Do or um, an old fencing book and learned about the appel, which is a, a French term. Uh, I believe it means uh, bell. So you're an appel end. Uh, and Ricky Tercius fought like an appel end. But it's where you stamp your foot on the ground to make an audible feint. And you hear about some guys, um, Joe Gans is the one they would say, he used to do a falling step into his jab, and every time he jabbed, he dropped his weight into it and made a big thump on the mat. And then you could, if you had a weapon where the opponent, not consciously but subconsciously, recognised that he was hearing that sound every time he was getting jabbed in the face, then when you do the, the stamp and you make the sound, they might react to it. Um, most of the time when you see it, it's absolute shit. It doesn't do anything. It maybe freaks the guy out for the first minute of the fight. He goes, what on earth? Do you mind? And uh, then after that, it just stops working. It just You just look like a bell end when you do it. And Ricky Tercios did look like a massive bell end in this fight. He was just throwing kicks in the middle of nowhere, from the middle of nowhere, and um, stamping his foot a lot. And he had something like 20 strikes landed for 150 attempted. And Eamon Zahabi, who came in with all the hype in the world because he's uh, Faraz Zahabi's brother, Got, I think he got starched by Ricardo Ramos in his uh, debut, but he he's proven to be a solid fighter, and he just behaved himself. He just did his job. He was very much a, prof a professional about it, and he handily outstruck Ricky Tercios, who was busy doing nonsense. Um, so, yeah, not a great look for Ricky Tercios, not a great look for the ultimate fighter, which he won. Just a reminder of how badly that show is doing now, or just the talent that it's bringing in. Um you know, we're not far removed from Ryan Hall coming in through it, but generally, ooh, you know, um, Maurice Green almost won the Ultimate Fighter while drunk. But Malarkey versus Johnson was the high point of this card. There was not an, an awful lot going on otherwise. David Anama versus uh, Garrett Armfield was, was fun. Um, they knew each other. They'd fought before and they'd trained together before. And James Krause was giving Anama uh, grief about being too uh, friendly and competitive with him. But the thing about training with people and working with them before is that you have seen them before and they've seen you and you have to dip a little bit deeper in your bag of tricks, even if you're a much better fighter. Because if you train together with someone long enough, even if they're much better than you, you'll find some tricks that annoy them. There's always those guys in the gym. Well, you know, I think this is why you hear those stories about gym killers who can't put it together on fight night. Um, you know, there are guys who do better when they know the opponent, when they know what they're dealing with and they work their game to that. But yeah, uh, really fun scrambly fight. Lots of wrestling along the cage. Lots of the James Krause stuff. Really great example of one of the things James Krause did an instructional on his wall work, and he the third part of it is him running drills with his team. Uh, looks like a great place to train and, and pick up this stuff. And uh, it's it's really interesting because basically all of his work cycles between going to the legs, going to the back standing, and uh, you know the odd trip, but mainly to set up the back takes and. The backstanding might sound like a goal, but often he's talking about, and then the opponent turns back into you and you drop on the waist again and you grab the double leg with no resistance. And there was a beautiful one in this one where Onama seemed to be getting round behind Armfield. Armfield thought he was doing well by turning back into him fast. And Onama just picked up both legs and basically rub rugby tackled him. Actually, no, he just picked him up in the air and slung him to the mat. And I think that was just before the arm triangle choke. But it was a perfect example of, well, this is the thing, a double leg takedown. Well, the reactive double double is a great uh, great example. If someone's throwing punches like they want to take your head off and you duck in underneath, you run through them effortless. It's the it's the um, 
it's when guys know there's wrestling coming that it's going to be a lot of effort to to wrestle with them. So when you when you catch someone out of position with a double leg, it really does feel like that martial arts magic stuff. It's when you have to fight for it that you're going, oh, I thought martial arts was supposed to be effortless and it was supposed to maximize my strength with technique and so on. You're going, yeah, but, you know, the dude saw it coming. I'm sorry, that's, that's just how that works. Then Antonina had a boring fight where she threw tons of hook kicks and they didn't work. I do like a diagonal hook kick uh, where you raise it up and it's coming almost down like an axe kick, but on a 45 or somewhere in between. Uh, so it's a hook kick, but coming down. And uh, I think it was Stephen Thompson Wonderboy called that a, a hatchet kick. And I've seen a couple of those lately. Uh, he used them in whatever Chuck Norris's very gay kickboxing association was called. Um, the one where you weren't allowed to kick the legs. But in that, when you take that out of the equation, f- guys try to find other ways to use their legs. And, and Stephen Thompson, there was two really good clips of him doing this. Uh, he's got a video talking about this kick, but there, I think he's got two clips of him doing it in that clip. in, in that. Um, video on his YouTube channel, but he'd stand orthodox against an orthodox opponent. He'd throw the hook kick up and then down behind the opponent's lead hand. So the the foot is doing a hand trap. And as it's coming down, you put it down close enough that you can step in and throw the right straight through the now undefended line of the right straight. Really cool technique. He dropped a couple of guys with it. I think he knocked one out. Obviously hard to replicate, but I'm all up for seeing people try it. Unfortunately, uh, Antonini was just throwing the hook kick, Southpaw versus Orthodox, which is trying to hit them in the face with it, and it wasn't really working. Casey, always fun on the ground, um, surprisingly, but I thought I thought she was robbed here in this decision because she actually came forward and looked to hit this lass and hurt her, and uh, did on a couple of occasions, and um, Antonina was busy throwing shit kicks from outside while her sister went, hey, um, like it was Lumpini, but really, really bad. I just, I hate the fucking apex. You know, I don't want to be one of those people who's obsessed with how the production looks outside of the fight, but it does suck just hearing the one guy who came in maybe as a plus one or maybe paid $500 for one of the 30 tickets and he's just going, woo, or making weird sounds. Um, There was a guy at a title fight. Fuck, what title fight was it? I was watching it the other day. And he just had some weird sound effect he was playing over and over again. You could hear it in the background of a world title fight. I tweeted it. I'll try and remember who it is and what the sound was. Wasn't boy Certainly wasn't. Bruh. Which I feel should be played during every women's uh, flyweight match. And then Co- Cody Gun Br- Brundage. Br- G- Cody Gundage. Cody Brundage, that is also a stupid name, beat Trayson Gore by uh, taking him down and then backing up to the fence and looking like he'd shit the bed <laughs> and then just hitting him with a, an overhand right. It was great. Um, so yeah, that was literally the whole card. Uh, I'm a little bit late this week, so I'm not going to do a question. I'll bounce into doing my next thing, which is uh, talking about this weekend's fights, which, if you hadn't noticed, not at the Apex, but still a fight night, but not at the Apex. They've got a live crowd, which means they're putting some fucking effort into it. We're on ABC, apparently. Don't know what that is. Always be closing. But we got Ortega versus uh, Rodriguez. we got Jingliang versus uh, Salakov, banger. We've got Matt Schnell versus Sumadere, uh What's his name? Sum- Sumadeji. Banger. Uh, we've got Shane Burgos versus Charles Jourdain. You know that's a banger. Ricky Simone versus Jack Shaw. Banger. Bill Algio versus Herbert Burns. Banger. And uh, Jessica Penn's opening the undercard, so she might try and jump in triangle, alas, along the fence. Really looking forward to this one. So I'll be back on Thursday to chat about that, or Friday. And, uh, yeah, if you want to get in on that, sign up to the Patreon, read my post-fight articles, which I didn't do this week, but I have been doing pretty much every week that there's a fight on otherwise. Um, and support the podcast, do that. If you want to send an email to the podcast, jackslackpodcast at gmail.com. And if you want to see what I'm writing anytime, fightprimer.com. I am your boy, Jack Slack. Valentina Shevchenko trying to will her sister into being a better fighter and failing. Bless. <laughs>